Hey financial controller, I need your help. My company applied for a bank loan and the bank asked for a cap table and I have no idea how to begin even putting that together. Okay, that's a fair question and I'll be very happy to help. So let's talk about it. So when companies begin to go into business, let's talk about a startup company that gets into business. At the very beginning of the business, there is no emphasis on putting together a cap table. And a cap table is basically an Excel file that shows who owns the company, right? Shows the percentage of ownership that goes to the CEO, the co-founders, and any other uh, VC or private equity company that invests in the firm. But as the company gets slightly bigger and begins to make more revenue, say somewhere around a million dollars a year in revenue, there becomes more need for financing from prospective banks in terms of loan or prospective investors in terms of equity. And that's when the company needs to put together a cap table that shows who owns the company. So in today's video, we'll be doing a couple of things. We'll be looking at an example cap table and walking through the key phrases that you'll see on the cap table. And then we'll talk about how to construct it. Where do you find the data necessary to put it together? And then third, how to maintain a cap table. That's the topic of this video, so stick around. All right, so now let's dive into my computer here and I'll show you a real life example of a cap table for a company. All right, so we're looking at the cap table or the capitalization table for Spa Booker Inc., which is a software company, right? And we're looking at it as of, you always have to have an as of date. So this is July 31st, 2022. And it's important to have a header to every table that you work with so that whoever is looking at this table at your work, they know what they're looking at right here, right? So what we got here at a basic level is you see the shareholder's name. So we got John Lee, uh, their position or relationship to the company, and then we have the number of common shares, the number of preferred shares, and we'll talk about the difference here in a minute between common shares and preferred shares. And then we'll have a column for options to purchase common shares. And then we have total shares, total fully diluted, and we'll talk about the definitions of all of these things here in a minute. And then uh, the percentage of ownership and percentage of ownership fully diluted. What fully diluted means is just you're taking the effect of stock options, right? So we'll talk about how I calculate this here in a minute. But as you can see by looking at the shareholders, the biggest shareholder here is John Lee, who is the CEO and co-founder, right? And this is often the case. So when you have a startup, you have a person or two people who started the company. These are the co-founders. Uh, in this case here, there's a man uh, who is a CEO who started the company, and then he gathered around him a bunch of co-founders, and uh, then he raised some funds through VC. So uh, John Lee started the company. He has uh, 270,000 common shares, 100,000 options uh, in the future to buy shares with that 100,000 options, right? So what he's got is total shares of 270 and then total fully diluted of three, uh, 370. When you look at his ownership, Right, so his ownership of the company is slightly above 50%, right? So this is, he owns a controlling interest in the company, 51%. But when you look at the percentage of fully diluted ownership, it's 29%. And the only difference here is that the fully diluted is taking the effect of stock options. So what a company does often is open up a pool of stock options. So in this case here, the total pool of stock options in column F is 750. Right, so 750 represents the total stock options that the company has uh, put out that they can allocate. In this case here, if you look um, in a shareholder column, we have ESOP, which is Employee Stock Option Plan allocated, and then Employee Stock Option uh, Plan unallocated. Right, if you add them all up, this is 750,000 options. From those 750,000 options, the company granted 100,000 to John Lee, who's a CEO, and granted 50,000 to Amy Goldberg, who is the COO and co-founder, and so on. You see Chris Evans, uh, Rocky Balboa, uh, all of these guys. Uh, so Rocky Balboa here is a board member. Uh, Stacy Block is another board member. And then you have this person here who is uh, an advisor. Oftentimes what the company does is at the beginning of its operation, uh, the company doesn't have money to pay for a legal counsel. So what they do is they give some common shares to an outside lawyer so they can handle all of the equity stuff and all of the contracts at the beginning of the business for a chunk of the company. And then when the company gets bigger in the future, then they can either pay a retainer to a lawyer or begin to hire an internal uh, legal counsel. So this is the high level view of what we have here. So for each person, we have common shares, right? And common shares 
uh, the difference between that and preferred shares is with common shares, you have voting rights in the company. Whereas with preferred shares, the advantage is that you have more rights to the income of the company. So when the company begins to declare a dividend as a preferred shareholder, you have more rights to, to get that dividend before the common uh, stockholder, right? Um, then you have um, options, total shares, and we talked about uh, the columns for total, total fully diluted, uh, percentage of ownership, and the percentage of ownership fully diluted. Um, just make sure you have a footing for each column and that the total percentage of ownership adds up to exactly 100%. Otherwise, if it's not 100%, you know that you have an error in the file, right? And to calculate the percentage of ownership, so for example, let's take an example of John Lee, right? He's a CEO, uh, 270,000 common shares, 100,000 options uh, in the future to buy shares with that 100,000 options, right? So what he's got is total shares of 270 and then total fully diluted of three, uh, 370. Now, his percentage of ownership is 51%, and we do that by taking his total shares and dividing it by the total shares outstanding. So we get that he owns 51% of the company. But when you do that by taking his total between equity and options, which is 370, and dividing it by the total pool diluted shares of the company, 1.275 million, in this case, his ownership drops from 51% to 29%. And by the way, all of these items here are addressed in detail in the Controller Academy, link in the description below. Okay, great, thank you for walking me through an example of a cap table, but how do I begin collecting the information necessary to put it together? All right, that's a great question. So where do you find this information? So what you're looking for is something called stock transaction ledger, which is just a ledger, a listing of all of the stock transactions of the company. And typically this information lives with the lawyer. Whoever the lawyer is that the company hired to, hunt, to handle the equity is the person that you should reach out to to get a stock transaction ledger. So let's take a look uh, here what a stock transaction ledger looks like. So what we got here is a ledger of all the transaction that says, okay, John Lee, who is a CEO, uh, bought number of shares, 270. Here is the date at which he bought the, uh, the stocks. Um, he paid $1 per share and the cash proceeds are, are $270,000. So this is just a listing of all of the transactions. Uh, this is for the stocks, so you should obtain a stock transaction ledger. And then for the options, because like we said, in the table, in the cap table, there's a column for options. With the options, you need a ledger of all the options. So the same, in the same way you obtain a stock transaction ledger, you obtain an option table or an option ledger that shows all of the issuance. So for example, this is an example of an option table for Spa Booker Inc. Uh, it shows here, for example, that Amy Goldberg, who is a COO on uh, the grant date 1-1-2022, the grant was 50,000 options at a strike price. And a strike price means this is the price at which Amy, this person here, can exercise, can purchase options in the future once she vests. So you're typically investing um, in a startup world is about four years. So as this person vests in this uh, grant here, she can begin to exercise her options. Uh, it's not something that she has to do, but she has the option to do. So 50,000 or 50, sorry, 50 cents is her strike price and the commencement day of the vesting is 1-1-2022, right? This is when the vesting begins. And the vesting schedule, which is something that's gonna have to be specified in the option plan, um, it will say 25% after one year, which is very typical in the startup world, right? To make the vesting uh, begin after one year so that the employee at least gives you one year, you tied him down for a year. And then after that, uh, it becomes 75% of uh, the remainder of the grant will um, vest over a three year period after that for a total of four years. And then on to the right here, we have a call price and total expense, which is something that we'll talk about uh, in a different accounting lecture. Uh, this will become handy when you uh, do the accounting recording uh, of the option expense, because as a company, when you issue stock options, you incur an expense that goes in your P&L. It's a non-cash expense, but it is a P&L expense nonetheless as a, a form of compensation that you're given to employees. So this is uh, the source of the data is gonna be Again, the stock transaction ledger, 
and the option table, this is what you're gonna be using to put together a cap table uh, from these two ledgers. And then finally, the way you maintain this table is that you create an entry every time you sell a stock or an employee exercises their option uh, or you raise equity from outside investors. So for example, going back to this table here, if we raise a new round of funding and say, uh, we will insert a row here that will say new investor. So just put in the name of new investor, right? And then you say investor, the relationship to the company. And then the number of shares that you're selling. So for example, 50,000, right? Uh, whether it's common or preferred, actually most often with outside investors, you have preferred shares, so 50,000, right? And just make sure to um, extend all of your formulas here to count for that, so totally, fully diluted. Uh, total shares, you pull that down, and then you get your formula down here, right? And then make sure that everything foots, so you have 100% ownership 100% ownership. And as you can see, if you remember, the CEO used to own 51% uh, of the company undiluted, and uh, it was about 29% diluted. But now, because we have a new investor, automatically this recalculated and says, now the CEO owns 47% 40 of the equity outstanding stock, but in a fully diluted basis, when you count all the options, the own only 28%, which is less than before, because now we have a new investor that we just inserted here. And that's the simple way of how you maintain a cap table. And that's it for this lecture on a quick overview of the cap table. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something from it. And I'll see you in the next accounting lecture. And by the way, I cannot believe that this channel has reached 100,000 subscribers. And it's all thanks to you uh, for watching, commenting, and liking my videos. I actually recorded here, uh, I'm gonna show you in a second, the moment uh, when we crossed 100K, I recorded it. They're looking at the subscribe button, they're like, I'm not sure if I wanna click that. <gasps>uh so super happy super grateful for you guys just watching the channel and commenting and interacting with my videos um my commitment to you is to continue uh, making videos that will benefit you continue to research and come up with content that i think is valuable to you uh so um thank you so much and i'll hope to uh, always exceed your expectations